And if you have your Bibles, we're going to be in Acts 19, so you can turn in there. And um, yeah, I've been out of sorts this morning. Uh, I, just some things have come into my life that are like, oh, knocked me down. And, and so I need to pray again. I don't know if you realize about this, but we've prayed like 80 times so far. This, we, we pray a lot, okay? And so I'm going to pray again because I need God to help me uh, when I say this. So let's pray. My Father, my God, I thank you for this day and again. And Lord, we come before you and thank you for every breath we take. Uh, thank you for that. And Lord, I pray that you'll just calm my heart and help me to speak the words that you've uh, put in my heart and, and the study that I've done. I just pray that you would put your words in my mouth so I can communicate them and that people would receive it. Lord, I pray that you open us all up, our minds and our hearts to wisdom and understanding so that we can learn more about your word, more about you, and more about how to live for you in our day-to-day -day lives. Lord, thank you for this opportunity, and Lord, I just pray that um, you would bless us this morning. Um, in Jesus' name, amen. So, have you ever been in awe of something? Awe. You know, sometimes that's a hard word. What does awe mean? It's a feeling of... A feeling of reverential respect. That was weird. Mixed with, mixed with fear or wonder. Okay? So that's what awe is. Um, it might be like coming into a big sports arena if you've never been there. Has anybody seen the movie Hoosiers? That little Indiana basketball team, they just play in the, it was back in the in early 50s or somewhere back there. And, and they, were, they played in this little town and a lot of fun and they got, they got really good. And so they went to the state championship. And they've never seen a stadium. They walk into the stadium and it's gigantic. And they're just like, how can I play here? And the coach was really smart. He, he measured the basketball hoop and measured the foul line and said, it's the same back in our home. But they were in awe of the Coliseum because it was so huge, so many people. It was, it was triple their town. I mean, all their town could be in there three times. It was just huge. Or how about a mountain? The first time you've seen a mountain? Some of you grew up here on the West Coast. I grew up in the Midwest. We have hills, not mountains. And so when we first saw the mountains, these majestic things, you're like, God made these and he's concerned about us. Really? Or the stars, the nighttime stars. Uh, in America, there's so much, I'd like to call it light pollution. You know, I mean, there's so, you can't see the stars. But in Puerto Rico, we did not have a good power grid, so the power would go off many times. And one of the favorite places for our kids, when the mosquitoes weren't that bad, <laughs> would to go on the basketball court, because it was like 30 feet from the ocean. We'd lay down on the basketball court and see the stars. Just all the stars, the billions of stars. And we think, God spoke, and those came into being. And yet, he died for you, not for the stars. Wow. And so, just in that perspective, looking at that majesty, God does miracles all the time. We should be in, God, in awe of God constantly. The miracle of birth. You guys realize that's a miracle? Anybody of you, any of you that are parents that you get that first bologna loaf, you know that's a miracle, right? You're just like, I would die for this thing. You know, I mean, it's just a miracle. And then how about for guys, any girl that would say, yes to marrying you that's a miracle right that love of a spouse that love of a person that knows the worst thing about you but stays with you that's what a spouse is supposed to do by the way young people married people uh, and then uh, how about jesus taking away your sins that should make you an, that should be the end of story right there that the God of the universe would die on the cross for your punishment. How many of you would be willing to go to, you know, uh, there's a trial, a mass murderer's on trial, and he gets found guilty, he's going to be put away. Wait a minute, I'll take his place. Just put that all on my record, let him go free. That's what Jesus did to us. Awe, right? Awe. We're going to be studying in this section, Paul is going to be coming to the city called Ephesus. And Ephesus is controlled by the evil one. Okay? Satan just has his hands everywhere there. And 
And Paul's been wanting to go there for a while, but God has told him no. But now God is opening the way. And so he's going to come to this place, but now he has some experience behind him. He's ready for the battle that's facing him in Ephesus. And so we're going to start looking at it. In, verse 19, or in chapter 19, verse 8, we're going to start in verse 8. And it says this. Then Paul went to the synagogue and preached boldly for the next three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. But some became stubborn, rejecting the message and publicly speaking against the way. So Paul left the synagogue and took the believers with him. Then he held daily discussions in the lectern hall of Tyrannus. This went on for the next two years, so that people throughout the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. Isn't it interesting? Everywhere that Paul goes, he's always trying to get his countrymen on board. He's always trying to get the Jews, come on, you guys, you know about this God. You knew that he was going to send a Messiah that was going to save us, and that name of the Messiah is Jesus, and he's here, so come on, let's go. We have our sins forgiven through this man. And sometimes the Jews are like, yes, I see it, that's awesome. But a lot of the times the Jews are like, I don't want that. If that means keeping everybody can come in, I don't want it. I want it for myself. I don't want it for everyone else. Forget that, Paul. Get out of here. They, they get angry. And why? Because of sin and pride. It's not our way. They even say, it's not God's way. You're preaching against God. That's what some of these Jews were saying to Paul. And not only that, when they have discussions with Paul, they, they can't win them because God has blessed Paul so he's able to communicate well what Jesus has done. And these guys are dumbfounded. They can't answer him, so they just say, what are, instead, you can't win an argument? What do you do? <laughs> they slander him. You're an idiot. Get out of here. Whatever. It, they don't stick to the discussion. They stick to, because all they have is to slander Paul. So Paul says, forget it. I'm leaving. And I'm going to go to this public place where we can talk about Jesus. And for two years, that's what he does. Paul is talking in an open forum to people who would hear. Now, you have to know a little bit about Ephesus to understand this. This is a city of 250,000 people. So it's a big city. You know, today we're like, what? We have 8 million. Well, back then, that was huge. This stadium right here is, was in Ephesus, still there, could seat easily 25,000 people. Think about that. And that was, they didn't have PA systems, you know. 25,000 people. Now, that's not Tyrannus. That's not that lectern, but that's the city forum where people could discuss and where trials were held and plays and different things were going on. And this city emphasized religion, philosophy, and material acquisition. Can I say that again? Religion, philosophy, and material acquisition. Does that sound familiar to anyone? These guys in Ephesus were trying to fill this hole in their lives. And I like to say a God-shaped hole. And they were putting all kinds of things in there. Materials, religion, philosophy, new ideas. They were trying to fill that. And they were trying to fill that hole with anything. Now, there's a, a, let me tell you the secret. Those things will not satisfy that hole. You know the thing that's going to satisfy a God hole? God, right? And so these guys are trying to fill everything in there, and it, well, they were sad. They didn't know what. This was no enjoyment. There was no insatisfaction. They would have it for a little time, but then it would be gone. Even God-fearing Jews, people that really believed God in this city, were corrupted by what the culture was teaching. And you go, well, what? how do you know about that? Well, there was a book that they have from first century Jewish magic. And it lists the names of angelic beings used in casting good and evil spells. This was the chosen people of God. This was a situation Paul was coming into. And Paul was saying, what is going on? You guys need a savior. Guess what? 
they need a savior, you need a savior. We all need a savior. We all fail. Do you ever do you ever get reminded that you failed? Yeah, God does, right? Not to put you down, but to say, look, you need me. Right? You need me. You need my son in your life. And that's why I tell people, you know, instead of trying to be always right, why don't you be always real? Why don't you be real and say, I blew it. You're right. Praise the Lord, I have a Savior that forgave me of that. And I will try to do better next time. Not just try, I'm going to train to do better. I like train better than try. Try assumes like failure. Training, what happens in training? Sometimes you do fail in training, but it's training. You learn from your failures, right? Have you ever heard that? This is totally off my notes. Anyway, try, I'm going to be tried to be a better Christian. You ever hear that? It implies, well, it's going to fail, but I'm going to try. How about I'm going to train to be a better Christian? I like that. I hope you like that because that gives the idea that when it does fail, that helps you in your walk and advancement with Jesus Christ. Too many times when we fail, people say, oh, that's it. You're done. How many of us have condemned people instead of saying, oh, yeah, you blew it there, but let me help you up. Get back in the training. Verse 11. God gave Paul the power to perform unusual miracles. Listen to this. When handkerchiefs or aprons that had merely touched Paul's skin were placed on sick people, they were healed of their diseases and evil spirits were expelled. Isn't that weird? When I read that, that sounds weird, right? Like, what? Where's this handkerchief? Right? You know? Uh, Paul, or God doesn't normally work like this, but why is he working like this now in Ephesus? Well, I'll tell you. The enemy of God was in full force in Ephesus. They had a Wiccan place there. They were all in about demons and serving the gods and trying to please them. They were casting spells. Even the Jews were casting spells. Ephesus was so much in the hands of the enemy that God needed to exercise even greater or more unusual divine powers to break the enemy grip on it. God knew what was going to happen to Paul because the hands of the enemy was in Ephesus. This goes back to God's timing. What do you mean? Paul tried to go to Ephesus twice. And God said, no, don't do it. He resisted him from going there. Why? That's weird. Paul's an evangelist. He wants to tell people, I want to go there. God knew he wasn't ready. Paul is now in a furious battle with the powers of darkness. And if he would have went beforehand, he wouldn't have been ready. The people wouldn't have been ready. Paul was thinking geography i got to tell as many people as fast as I can, as much as I can. God was thinking timing. Timing. The key to success would be timing. And notice the people that went before him. First, Priscilla and Aquila went. Then this guy called Apollos went. And they prepared people to hear what Paul had to say. Paul comes, and, they, and he tells them those things. And people are like, what, what? Is this true? Is this not true? I don't get this. And then God used the people's superstitions to validate Paul's message. Can God use anything to validate his message? He can. Who ever heard of getting a handkerchief and putting it on somebody to cast out an evil spirit? That's crazy. Right? But God did it. It's awesome. And when people saw this, do you think they were like a little amazed? Were they in awe? They were. They're like, where can I get a hand on one of those things? And this is something that's really important. This was the Lord's prerogative to work this way, not Paul's. Do you hear me? It was the Lord's prerogative. God worked miracles through Paul, not Paul working miracles by God. 
See the difference there? The emphasis is on God, not Paul. And God, in his sovereignty, chose to work this way to open the doors in Ephesus. So any of you guys get the idea? I'm just going to get a handkerchief, give it to somebody. It's not going to work. It's got to be from God. Verse 13. A group of Jews was traveling from town to town casting out evil spirits. They tried to use the name of the Lord Jesus in their incantation, saying, I command you in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preaches, to come out. Seven sons of Sceva, a leading priest, were doing this. But one time when they tried it, the evil spirit replied, I know Jesus, I know Paul, but who are you? Then the man with the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them, and attacked them with such violence that they fled from the house naked and battered. I have to tell you, there will always be counterfeits to Jesus Christ. Always. Because the enemy that we are up against, the devil, does not have an original idea. He is always trying to copy God. You doubt me? Read Revelations. Satan has his own Messiah. It's called the Antichrist. Satan is always trying to set up his throne in heaven, trying to be over God. He's not trying to set up his own little independent kingdom. He wants to be over God. Satan is not creative. God is creative. Satan is not creator. God is creator. Satan is always trying to mimic God. And even with miracles, God, uh, Satan is trying to mimic. Isn't it weird? Don't you think it's weird that these seven guys are going around preaching about Jesus but not believing in him? They are. We command you to come out in the name of Jesus, the guy who, that Paul's preaching about. Is that a personal faith? No, that's like another spiritual being. Let's use him. Let's put his name in the, maybe we get some more coin. You know? The spiritual battle is what this whole history is about. It started in the Garden of Eden. It's going to end when Jesus destroys the earth and the heavens and, and the Jerusalem and makes all things new. And all in that history, that whole history, it's about Satan trying to counterfeit Jesus, trying to counterfeit God, trying to mimic God. And there's a spiritual battle going on for all that history. These seven may be trying to help, but I have an idea that they're not trying to help. They're just trying to get more coin. But here's the bottom line. It's dangerous to combat evil forces without God. And I have to ask you, how many of you pray in the morning, Lord, protect me and help use me to glorify you? You know what that's like if you don't do that? It's like you're going into battle with a sword, and you put the sword on the table, and then you go to war. Praying to God in the morning, saying, God, today I dedicate my life to you. Today I want to serve you. Today I want to be a good trainer. Trainee, excuse me, trainee, right. A good trainee. And you go out, and... What if you do fall? What happens? Get back up. God's going to get you back up and say, it's okay. Today was rough. Tomorrow's another day. Get back in it. The power that flowed through Paul comes from God. If you think you're going to change the world without God, good luck. And in Ephesus, evil didn't mess around. When evil saw Paul coming... They lowered their guns at them, and he went, they went after him. And when he, they couldn't discourage him, they had the Jews fight against him. And then when they left, they had the outside people trying to attack him. And so God worked a miracle through him. And this story about what happened, verse 17, the story of what happened spread quickly all throughout Ephesus. To Jews and Greeks alike, a solemn fear descended on the city. And the name of the Lord Jesus was greatly honored. Many who became believers confessed their sinful practices. A number of them who had been practicing sorcery brought their incantation books and burned them at the public bonfire. 
The value of the books were several million dollars. So the message about the Lord spread widely and had a powerful effect. What were happening to the people in, in Ephesus? They're in awe about God. The God-shaped hole now has the key. God is in the scene. Not these fake gods. The one true real God. And he comes and he says, this is who I am. And people are like, when they see the, the miracles that happen, they hear the word preached, they are in reverend and great a great reputation of God is spread. And not only that, they did action. They gave up something of value. Now, in, in some of your translations, it says 50,000 silver coins, okay? One silver coin was equal to about one day's work in that day. So all that would equal 136 years of continuous work. That's the value of that. Around $5 million, if not greater. And these guys that worked in the sorcery realm, they voluntarily gave up their income. They gave it up. They put their books that they had that really didn't have power. Because God is the only one that has power. Satan has power, but it's counterfeit. It's not true power that God has. And they threw it in there. So these guys, too, all these guys, you can't spend your money on the power of darkness, so what are people going to turn to? They're going to turn to God. They're going to turn to the light. And that's why Ephesus started to be a beacon for Jesus Christ, a light for Jesus Christ. Afterward, Paul felt compelled by the Spirit to go over to Macedonia and Archaea before going to Jerusalem. And after that, he said, I must go on to Rome. He sent his two assistants, Timothy and Erastus, ahead to Macedonia while he stayed a while longer in the province of Asia. The work is established, and it's time to move on. Paul has been there for two years, and people are hearing, and disciples are being discipled. People are growing in Christ. The relationship is going, going great with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul's heart is now for the body of Christ and its people and people in the entire world. He wants to visit the churches, encourage them, and tell more people about Jesus. He's not easily sitting down and waiting. God called him to Ephesus. He got it done, and now he's ready to go. God is and was and is always calling Paul to tell others about his son. So Paul wants to continue his calling. He wants to visit the churches that's already been established. Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. That's all in Macedonia. And then he's going to visit Corinth, that city we talked about not too long ago. And that's in Archaea. And then Jerusalem. And then Rome. He has his eyes set on the world. I want to ask you, how many of you have set your eyes on the world? Well, not too many. How about your neighbor? Oh, sorry, you just got personal, John. Back up. Have you, does your neighbor know you're a Christian? A Christ follower? Paul's ready to go. He is training people, disciples, to minister after him. And this is so cool. He's been doing it first. Now he's training people to go before him. Do you notice that? He's going to send two guys ahead of him to prepare people when he's going to come. That's awesome. And one of those guys, we don't know who this, um, uh, we know about Timothy, but Erastus, he was probably a slave, and that means beloved. His name means beloved. And he probably didn't hold on to his name because um, the slaves were usually numbered. That was their name, one, two, three, four, five. He probably didn't want to keep his number, and so he got a new name, and it was beloved. Paul in the city had a lot of struggles and a lot of trials, and he was constantly up against the enemy. I want to ask you, um, can living for Jesus be hard work? It not just can. It is hard work. Why? Because the enemy says, that guy's living for Jesus. That lady's living for Jesus. I need to attack them. You know, I, I've been listening to different po podcasts about marriage and different things because it just getting some training for myself because I always like to learn more about being married because I've been married for 30 years and I haven't got it figured out yet. So I'm still learning. 
Um, so I'm listening to this, and um, the, this guy that was preaching on marriage, he goes, you know, all you singles out there, you think the, uh, the enemy attacking is bad now. Wait till you get married. Because you know when Satan attacked in the garden? After Adam and Eve were married. That's when Satan attacked. Not beforehand. So you think, you think that the enemy is attacking hard now, and you think marriage will solve everything. Er, talk to somebody that's been married for a while. Because that's when the enemy comes in and wants to really destroy you. Living for Jesus can be hard work. Paul has been there for two years. He's been living, discussing, working. He's trying to convince people about Jesus. And the people of Ephesus were having a hard time responding at different points until God broke in with Paul. And then all of a sudden, that's who God is. Wow, that's why we need God. That's why Paul needed God. The enemy had such a grip on their lives that it was so hard to break through that God didn't awe them until God came in. I got a, got a thing for you. You know, a lot of people are not in awe of God. And unfortunately, some, sometimes it's even us Christians. We lose our awe of who God is. And the reason we do that is because there's a hardening of a heart. There's a hardening of a heart. Have you ever heard somebody says, I can't wait to get to heaven. I'm going to tell God. <laughs> Have you ever heard have you ever heard that? I've heard, I got questions for him, and he better answer them to my satisfaction. Where's the awe? That's not going to happen, by the way. Because remember the song we sang, Every Knee Will Bow? That's what's going to happen. <laughs> People are going to get before God and not be like, they're going to be either I blew it or thank you, Jesus, for saving me and being welcomed. So that's gradual hardening of the heart. For the unsaved, for the people that don't know about Jesus, this comes naturally. Because in order to go before God, it requires humility. And they don't want to be humble. Even in our culture, we don't like to be humble, right? Somebody says, uh, women, you ready to get a little offended here? A woman, you know, someone says, submit to your husbands. I will never submit. I'm an American. You know, we don't like to be an author under authority. We want to be, we have our freedom. Our forefathers paid for those free freedoms, and I don't have to be subject to anyone. Is that what the Bible teaches? Get in the book. This hardening sometimes can be gradual and silent, and it's usually subtle, and it goes in imperceptible ways. It just comes in, and then, Suddenly, you're hard. You'll resist everything that's told you, everything that the Spirit is trying to tell you. It really comes from no spiritual guidance. A lot of times, people will get saved and then say, well, I'm saved, and that's good enough. That's a starting point. You're starting the relationship. Could you imagine if you got married and said, okay, I'm married, and never see the person again? Are you married? Well, in name only, right? Right? It's not, you're not married. Ask anybody. We, you have to communicate. You have to be together. You have to build the relationship together. That's when you become a Christian, the relationship starts. And, the, you know, the cool thing is we get all of eternity to explore that. That's awesome. Here on this earth, we have this sinful, sinfulness that's in the way, and we have to fight that and control it and learn more about being sanctified, becoming more like Jesus Christ. But then when we're in heaven, you think we're just going to know everything? We're going to learn too. When Adam was first created, I'll give you a secret. When Adam was first created, he was given some things. He was given work. In a perfect world, he was given work. And not only that, he was able to learn more about God, the God that created him. You know how I know that? They sat and wa or they walked in the cool of the evening, talking. You think if they knew everything about each other, they didn't need No, Adam didn't know about God fully. He was able to communicate, but he didn't know God fully. So he's able to talk and learn. We're going to do that in eternity. I'm excited about that. Anyway, um, 
So if we don't have the spiritual guidance, we learn to cope with our guilt and shame apart from God. How many of you, after you become a Christian, never sinned after that? No, you sin. But here's the thing. Sometimes we feel guilty and we have this oh, shame and we're like, oh, we're not good. God, I, gotta re I need to get resaved. Do you need to get resaved if you sin? Thank you, congregation. That's right. Because once you're saved, it's the Holy Spirit's job to keep you saved, not yours. If it was yours, we'd be getting saved every day. Because we'd be failing every day. But here, you know, so we cope with that guilt and shame and we say, oh, I'm, I'm unworthy, God. Why do you love me? The, did, God love, did God know you were going to sin after you entered a relationship with him? Does God still love you? There's a verse that we learned not too long ago. Nothing can separate you from the love of God. Life, nor death, angels, principalities, anything. There's nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Why? Because he sent his most precious gift for you. Jesus lived a perfect life, didn't have to die, but he chose to die for you to, pay, to make your slate clean. And we as Christians, when we get saved, that slate is clean. Sins are forgiven, past, present, and future. The problem is we like to hold on to that guilt. Oh, see, I told you I was no good. I told you I was going to fail. Instead of going to the cross and saying, God, I blew it again. I blew it in my training. Help me. I need more training. And in the, in the life of the believer, you have the Holy Spirit knocking on your heart going, hey, you need to look at this. Hey, there's something going on here. And unfortunately, a lot, of, a lot of us steadfastly resist that, right? Oh, don't worry about it. I'll take care of it later. I don't know. And we keep on resisting the spirit. And what happens, the truth starts to confront us daily and it bounces off our hard hardness. There's a flash of something, but it doesn't penetrate. Because we become hard. So the question, you know, the obvious question is, how do we gain or regain that awe of God? We need to be willing. We need a willingness to surrender. We need a willingness to surrender. To abandon everything we've used to substitute our relationship with Jesus for. We need to abandon it. Here's the thing, uh, it's different for everyone, but we all have it. We all place this thing in front of God. Instead of putting God in this awe, we say, well, you know what? I need money, so I don't need to go to church. I don't need to do devotions. I, I, I just need money to help me so I can live and be a better Christian. Is money going to help you be a better Christian? If you don't know Jesus, is money going to give you satisfaction? It might be good for a time, but it's not going to fill that God-shaped hole. How about possessions? The one with the most toys wins. How about self-reliance, power, relationship, alcohol, drugs, sex, achievements, religion, recognition? I mean, we could go on for pages on what could be placed and what we view as valuable in place of God. You know what yours is. You're, you're having trouble still? What if we had two chairs here and you were talking with God privately? And what are you afraid that to lose if the Lord pointed it out in a private conversation? You know, you're hanging on to your kids too much. Your kids are your God, not me. You're hanging on to your spouse too much. Your spouse is the God, not me. You're hanging on to your house too much, your money, relationship, substance. What is it in your life that's keeping you from awe of God? God wants you to come and give everything, surrender all to him, all to thee. All to thee I surrender all. Let's pray.
My Father, my God, I thank you for this lesson. I thank you for this um, city that was impacted by what you did through Paul. And Lord, I pray that you will help us to surrender everything in our lives to you, that we would come before you and be a light to others because we're in awe of you and in our lives. Lord, I pray a blessing upon these people and as you work in our hearts from this message that it would have fruit and that we would follow you wholeheartedly. In Jesus' name, amen.